Okay, this is Black's Law fourth, except to receive with approval or satisfaction. To receive with intent to retain. See Morris versus State 102, Arkansas 513, 145 Southwest. Also, in the capacity of drawee of a bill to recognize the draft and engage to pay it when due. Okay, retain, Black's Law fourth, to continue to hold, have, use, recognize, etc., and to keep Kimball Trust and Savings Bank versus Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company. So you'll notice they used recognize and retain. So let's look up recognition, ratification, confirmation, and acknowledgement that something done by another person in one's name had one's authority. Recognize, to try, to examine in order to determine the truth of a matter. Also, to enter into a recognizance. Recognizance, an obligation of record entered into before some court of record or magistrate duly authorized with condition to do some particular act as it appears at the, to, as to appear at the Aziz's which is a court in England in olden times, or criminal court to keep the peace, to pay a debt, or the like. It resembles a bond. Recognizance. Really? I mean, who thinks of it as a bond? In the, in the practice of several of the states, a, spe a species of bail bond or security given by the prisoner, either on being bound over for trial or on his or on his taking an appeal. Acceptance. The taking and receiving of anything in good part and, as it were, a tacit agreement to a preceding act which might have been defeated or avoided if such acceptance had not been made. There you go. You took, you you got a letter. If you retain the letter, it's acceptance. If it's acceptance, it's agreement to the contract. From Black's Law, fourth, acknowledge, to own, avow, or admit, to confess, to recognize one's acts, and to assume the responsibility therefore. Do you acknowledge receipt of that letter from our finance department? Okay, so you're saying you own it, you avow it, you admit it. Acknowledgement. To acknowledge is to admit, affirm, declare, testify, avow, confess, or own as genuine. Favillo versus Bank of America, National Trust and Savings Association, California Appellate. Okay, and we're still under acknowledgement, generally implying obligation or incurring responsibility Weyerhaeuser Timber Company versus Marshall and then act of a person who avows or admits the truth of certain facts which if established will entail a civil liability upon him thus the debtors acknowledgement of the creditors demand or right to action will toll the statute of limitations so it wouldn't be a good thing to acknowledge the debt, would it? Not if you're contesting it. So if they ask you if you acknowledge something, I would say no. Every court case starts, first of all, we don't want to go to court. Going to court is a losing proposition. If you're going to go to court, the whole thing is stacked against you. You have a judge who refuses to answer your questions which is the denial of due process because you have a right to be heard and as you saw it would be fraud not to explain things to me if I have a question that that's relevant to the case and I'm talking about if you can't define your terms like what a motor vehicle is or what due process of law is or what probable cause is or do I have uh, constitutional rights or not and you can act like it's no big deal for you if you're the judge or the district attorney or whatnot. 
but you're playing with making a demand when you have no authority to and if I challenge your authority to make the demand and you don't prove it to me then you're just proceeding as a pirate I don't want to go to court I never want to go to court trying to educate judges is a waste of my time they're not really interested in being educated I've been to court a number of times and it's interesting to see the uh, court personnel not even read your paperwork because they can't be bothered with listening to what you have to say in your defense. They get you in court and they want to forget all the paperwork you've put into the record like Bill Thornton would say. They don't want to look, look at your paperwork. What they want to do is to get you into contract with them verbally. So you pretty much, unless you're really skilled at verbal confrontations with people, these people are experts at it. I mean, if you were selling shoes all day, you would probably be a good shoe salesman. Guess what? These guys are like, you know, <laughs> home improvement salespeople. They just put the pressure on and they know how to get what they need to get from you when you're in court. So going to court is not a good place to be. So how do you avoid going to court? Well, in order to go to court, there has to be a controversy. There has to have been administrative remedy, administrative, some kind of administrative procedure prior to going to court. Now that doesn't always occur in the case of a traffic a stop or something like that, but generally administrative procedures, they have to write, if you want to take somebody to court, you have to write them a letter and tell them that there's a problem between you and give them the opportunity to solve the problem, right? Hey, you get to make your claim and if they ignore you, then you've got, you've got some evidence that you tried to settle it on your own. Like the Bible says, you know, settle the matter while you're in the way with your neighbor before he drags you to court and the magistrate puts you in jail. So, you have an opportunity to settle the matter before you go to court. If the person is making unreasonable claims and they're not substantiating their claims and they don't have a legitimate claim, then they have no real reason to bring you to court, but they will do it anyway. Because they know, once you do get into court, if they can get the judge to give, to sign an order, then they can put guns, you know, you know, at his discretion, they can use guns to go collect from you. Whereas they can't do that on their own. They need to get a judge signed order to get somebody with a gun to come out and harass you. So, if they can't get you to court, then they have a problem. Now, what are we looking at in the court process? There's, it starts off with administrative remedy and a controversy, and then it goes into a service of process. And Dave DeRimer's approach is to stop, stop the proceeding at the service of process stage. The service of process stage is they have to notify you that there's an issue. They have to send you a summons. So you're either going to get a ticket by a policeman that, that they consider that service of process. The policeman, if you think about it, the policeman physically serves you the paperwork, doesn't he? It's like tapping you on the shoulder. He physically hands it to you and he's gonna swear that he served you and there's nothing you're gonna say about it. However, just because he serves you the paperwork doesn't mean that you are engaging in a contract with him. Why not? Because you can return the paperwork like, hey, you know what, I'm really not interested in buying the siding from you this week. And if you look at it like it's a contract and you return it, then you, you have no intent to retain it and it's, you don't, you don't, you're not in possession of it anymore. You're not acknowledging it. You're not keeping it. So here's the neutral response letter from David DeRimer. At the top of the page, you would say affidavit of third party mailing. And then if you're going to send it certified mail, you'd set certified mail number and put the sticker, the peel off sticker on the top of the letter. Otherwise, first class mail. The enclosed documents and materials were inadvertently received and opened by mistake. So you can always correct a mistake. So the first thing you're going to state, it was a mistake. These enclosed documents, which appear to be, and then you're going to name the documents you know, request for debt payment from such and such uh, law firm or whatever. Dated such and such a date and signed by so and so or unsigned. 
he just described the document. But you'll notice it says, which appear to be. And that's because you're not going to ever admit that they are, like a notice of default. If you say it appears to be a notice of default, that's different from saying it is a notice of default. If you say it is a notice of default, you're recognizing it and you're admitting that it is a default. Okay, so we go down to are not understandable, acknowledgeable, or recognizable. Now we've read the definitions of recognize and acknowledge. And understand is to stand under. So understand is to agree to something. Acknowledge something is to agree to something. And now we know that recognize is to agree to something. Under the penalty of false personation and or false post location. Now in his letter he just says under the penalty of false personation. I added and or false post location. What's false personation? Okay, they send it to you in your all capital letter name. That's a false personage, right? It's not me. So you have to watch the show that is on um, Straw Man Redemption to understand the fictional world where John Doe, the straw man, is not you and the reasons why. You have to get a firm understanding of that. And then uh, post location is the fact that Washington, D.C., the government in Washington, D.C., the corporation known as the United States, has jurisdiction, according to the Constitution, over the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. and its territories and possessions. Okay, here we have from Title 26, this is the Inter Internal Revenue Code, Section 3121, Definitions, right? So we're in Definitions and we're at Cornell Law University. And we look up state, United States, and citizen. For the purposes of this chapter, state. The term state includes, and we know what the word includes mean when you tar start talking from a legal standpoint, it excludes everything else. Includes the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. And that's it. It doesn't mean California, Texas, Oregon, it just means those places, which are what? Territories and possessions of the corporate government, the federal government that exists in Washington, D.C. Two, United States. The term United States, when used in a geographical sense, includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. In a geographical sense. So, the land. Here they're defining the United States when used in a geographical sense is only the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. Okay, here's the U.S. Constitution. Powers granted to Congress, Article 1, Section 8. And we go over to to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may by session of particular states and acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States. Where would that be? Washington, D.C., the 10 mile square. And sh to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature. Territories and possessions. So if it's a territory and possession, Congress can pass laws that apply to it. If it's not, they can't. And what they have done is they've turned all the several states into Washington, D.C. territories and possessions, which they're not, but they differentiate them by stating the two-letter uh, state abbreviation and having a zip code. If you live in a two-letter state like CA or TX and you have a zip code, then you're stating that you live within the United States, but in reality you don't. So if you, if you want to be separate from that, if you want to be seen Fictional entities live in those places. Real people live in the states where the state is spelled out and don't have a zip code location. And if you believe that you, don't, that you are not going to get mail unless there's a zip code attached to it, you're wrong. If you look up the domestic mail manual in section 602, which I'm going to show you, you can address mail to a post location that does not have a zip code on it 
if you're sending it registered mail and if you're sending it first class mail. But if you're sending it certified mail, it's required to have a zip code. The enclosed herein contains the aforementioned and misdirected documents. And you will put all everything that you got in the letter. So you're going to put the letter itself that's been torn open. You're going to put all the documents that they gave you. And you're going to make photocopies of them so you have a copy of them. But the originals would go back to the party who sent them. So you're returning their documents to them because that indicates that you're not trying to retain them and agree to some kind of a contract. There's no intent to retain. As there is not enough knowledge or information disclosed to form a responsive answer. Now, they never give you enough information. If, if the credit card company says that you owe them money, they never show you a contract. They never state that you that you were paid money they never show you that you authorized the payment to you of money you know they very rarely will ever send documentation that proves their case right as there is not enough information disclosed to form a responsive answer said documents and materials are being returned forthwith and then i put notice to the agent is notice to the principal on the bottom so in case that you know you're claiming that you don't that the you know the principal didn't get get it and just one of their agents sent that out but the principal is capital one or something like that and so they had somebody else send it out nope you know i've given you notice now david de reimer's approach with this letter here is that it's a neutral response there's no argument there is no controversy he's not disputing any of the facts there's no refused for cause i'm not accepting this or conditional acceptance i'm accepting it if you can prove your case there's no dispute there's no argument i'm not arguing with you this is you know you've addressed these incorrectly to me and there's nothing in here that i can respond to and i'm not acknowledging or recognizing them so it's beautiful. He's done a very good job of creating this. So that's one way to um, stop service of process. That would be the most you know, immediate thing would be like a traffic ticket. You would, in a, in a case where you've got somebody sending you stuff where you're not in court, like a, a credit card company or a foreclosure issue or the IRS, you just take the letters and bundle it up and send it back to them. And if you send it back with certified mail, then you can prove that they got it, right? You can prove that it was delivered back to them. David DeRimer's approach, he states, you put the address where, where the regular address would go, and you also put it in the return address. You do not use your name and address in the return address. You put the same address of where it's going, who, you know, who mailed it to you, what's their address, you put that in the return address. So it would just cycle around. If they refused it, it would just keep coming back to them no matter what. Number two, you do not want to sign anything. You don't want to put your name and address on anything. It's just you, you leave the page as blank and return it to them. And the only thing you're going to do is make a photocopy and have somebody sign a proof of service or what I would do what I do is I just get a video camera and videotape myself putting the uh, documents in the envelope and licking the envelope or sealing it up with a sponge with water on it and putting stamps on it. So it's documented that those items went back into that envelope. And then I go down to the post office and document with the video camera me putting it in the mail slot and hold my cell phone up and put the date, you know, the date is on the cell phone and I just make sure that it's noted that on this date, this, this uh, mail got dropped into the postal slot. I do it with first class mail for stuff that really isn't that important. But if it was a court case, a ticket, or um, some, you know, something that was serious, I would do certified mail or registered mail. Registered mail doesn't need a zip code. It can go back to a person directly, right? You can't send domestic mail to a person. Well, you can, 
but it has to have a zip code and it has to have the territory in two letters or the post office won't accept it. So depending on how important it was, I would only use registered mail if it was really important because the cost involved in sending registered mail to I get involved in, in uh, counterclaiming people where I might counterclaim six, eight, ten. I got one case where I got 16 recipients, okay? 16 recipients ends up costing a lot of money. So the cheapest way is the best way. Anyway, if I send it first class and it's going someplace not too far, I can call them up within a reasonable amount of time and I just call them and ask the secretary or whatever did you receive a letter from so from so and so and um, you'd be surprised how often they'll say yeah we received that letter and get my little voice recorder going and put this uh, um, put the phone on speakerphone and away you go now I got voice recording that the secretary admits that they got the letter it's just as good as certified in fact, it's even better because they actually admit that they got it. Okay, then we go to something more serious where, like, let's say you have a traffic ticket. You want to take the ticket, the original of the ticket, make photocopies of it, like three photocopies at least, and send the original back to the officer who gave it to you. Find out, you know, which, um, which address he works at and mail it to, you always mail things to the individual in their upper and lowercase name, first and last name if you have it. If you don't have it, they identify themselves by badge number or whatever. So it'd be like, you know, Officer Powers, badge number 937. So then that would be their identifier. And then it's to the person, if you have their, it's to the man or woman's name, first and last name, care of, you know, the uh, Alameda Sheriff's Office and then the address. Then you would also send a copy of it to the court because you have to let the court know that you returned it and it, you, you know, you're not having anything to do with it, you're not retaining it, you don't understand it and you're just sending it back. So you want to be able to prove to the court that you returned it. Now of course the court's going to ignore that or I've had them send it back to me. But if you don't put your return name and address on it then usually they just look you up because the ticket is addressed to a certain party at a certain address, right? So they'll never send it to you at an address that doesn't include the two-letter um, legal fiction state and zip code. And they'll never send it to you. Well, that's not completely true. They'll send it to you 99% of the time in, a, in the uh, straw man name, all capital letters. But I get get them sending it to me in upper and lower case. In fact, I even get letters sometimes where they, they actually get pretty hip to it. They go, my name, upper and lower case, care of my address, but they'll always have the zip. Always have the zip. Anyway, so you, t you take those letters, and I've talked to, uh, emailed David DeRimer, and he made it clear. My interpretation was that yeah, lack of retention would be a big thing. So when if the IRS sends me a, a certified mail letter and I have a stamp made up that says return at returned refused as addressed, and I talked to the postman, postmaster, and they said that was the correct wording to use instead of return to sender. They don't like return to sender. Refused as addressed because it's addressed incorrectly as far as I'm concerned. I'm not the all capital letter name. That should be that's somebody else's mail, not my mail. So David Reimer said that doesn't work and that that's not a good way to do it. So I have to take his uh, word for it. I can see where if you're refusing something, then you're kind of like participating in a controversy. It's a little bit different. So anyway. Instead of uh, refusing it, he says you go ahead and sign for it, open it up, and then put everything, put photocopy it, put, every, put the contents in a new envelope, and mail it back with the neutral response letter. The information is back with them, it's not with you anymore. This is how to take care of service of process. The idea that if I if you give me something and you're trying to enforce whatever you give me as like it's a contract and I give it back to you, then it's no longer in my court, it's back in your court. I've had, um, 
a little run in with uh, DMV. I demand that you reply to my affidavit and answer each and every point in an affidavit of your own. Failure to rebut my affidavit within 30 days will result in a default and you will, by acquiescence and latches, have lost the right to rebut my claims. You will have tacitly agreed to my claims on, upon failure to rebut them within 30 days. And I had the head of DMV send a letter back to me re, re, returning all of the information I sent her, including which was a lot more than just that one letter. And she said, it's like, I don't know, how clear could it be? Rebut my affidavit point by point. So it's a game, right? And, and it's really interesting when you start watching the uh, government using the same technique. It's exactly the same. Here, we're going to just send your, you your stuff back. A couple years ago, my daughter got a traffic ticket, and we sent her all this, pa we sent paperwork to the traffic court. And you know what? The traffic court sent all the paperwork back and refused to accept it. I mean, this is, they accepted it, and they stamped, they date stamped the, the envelope that they had received it, but they returned it all. So returning the documents is a very powerful thing. We just don't understand how powerful it is, and we don't see how it would work. This is just, you know, my take on it is that it is very powerful. And this, there's, I look at it like there's three stages I'm going to go through in taking on somebody who is attacking me. The first stage is I'm going to do David DeRimer's approach of returning their their little gift to them, stating, oh, I'm not really interested, thank you very much. And if they continue and they start into harassment, like launching a suit against me, I would return the summons the same way. But if they get to the point where they're going to arrest me and take me downtown and book me or something like that, then it gets to be into stage two. Stage two, I'm going to have to respond to this and my response is going to be more like Ticket Slayer's response. I'm going to go through filing an affidavit and I'm going to put, the, put my writing into the record and I'm going to um, file writs of precipe and writs of mandamus to force them into a default position and then I'm going to show up in court that I demand that the case be thrown out because the court has defaulted. Let's say they just even after three attempts to get the court to default, the court just is, refuses and continues to uh, roll on. Well, you can always, you know, object to everything and not consent to anything. And, you know, you don't have to give any information. But if you're going to show up, like I said, once you've shown up, they consider it an appearance, even if you, even if you say, I'm here by special appearance to challenge jurisdiction only, they continue like you're there to play. If you don't show up, they just issue a bench warrant. Here's Black's Law 4th, 1968. Appearance. In practice, a coming into court as a party to a suit, whether as plaintiff or defendant. So you will have made an appearance if you come into court, regardless. The formal proceeding by which a defendant submits himself to the jurisdiction of the court. A formal proceeding in which the defendant submits himself to the jurisdiction of the court? I mean, he doesn't have to. Submission sounds like a voluntary thing, right? The voluntary submission to a court's jurisdiction, Basilio versus Scarpati. Voluntary, there it goes again. I mean, how many people go to court voluntarily? So it has to be voluntary to be an appearance. An appearance may be either general or special. The former is a simple and unqualified or unrestricted submission to the jurisdiction of the court. The latter is a submission to the jurisdiction for some specific purpose only. So when you go in and say, I'm here by special appearance or restricted appearance or special visitation, I'm not here submitting to the jurisdiction of the court voluntarily. I'm here just for one purpose. What's that purpose? Not for all purposes of the suit. A special appearance is for the purpose of testing the sufficiency of service or the jurisdiction of the court. A general appearance is made where the defendant waives defects of service and submits to the jurisdiction. So if you don't 
go into court and claim that you're there by special appearance, you're waiving all defects of service and you're, you're submitting to the jurisdiction of the court. So let's think about what would be a defect of service. What is service? Service is the acceptance of a summons, right? They send you a summons in the mail, and if you retain it and don't return it, then they have served you. And if you show up in court, it clinches the deal, and you waive the defect of service. So if you go in there to challenge service, hey, I didn't accept the contract. I'm not here voluntarily. I'm here under threat and duress, and I'm here to challenge defective service, and I'm also here to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. The next phase, the third phase, is if, if they refuse to honor the ticket slayer approach of uh, an affidavit saying that um, the, the party that's being charged is not me, you know, I'm not John Doe in all capital letters, I'm a sovereign, I have a right to claim sovereignty, and then I have, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 things to claim in, a, in an affidavit that would basically defeat pretty much any charges against me unless I actually caused an injury or loss to somebody. Up it with the ticket slayer approach. The third approach to me would be to go on the attack. Howard Griswold makes a point that, that the only true response to somebody attacking you in court is to attack them back. And I believe that. Once they go, we're not, you know, we're not just going to drop it. Then it goes into counterclaim. And I'm going to be all ready to go with a counterclaim. And if not, you know, I'm going to whip up a counterclaim within a very short time of the arraignment where they've refused to drop it with the ticket slayer approach. And in my counterclaim, I'm going to ask for big money. I've already got an act of state filed into the record. Here's from Black's Law Fourth, act of state. An act done by the sovereign power of a country or by its delegate within the limits of the power vested in him. An act of state cannot be questioned or made the subject of legal proceedings in a court of law, wherein I can bill them $100,000 per party for each incident where they attack me without any constitutional authority. And, I, and in any case, unless I actually caused an injury or loss to somebody. So the counterclaim becomes pretty serious. And if I go in as a counterclaimant, then I'm the plaintiff and I have a lot of authority and power that way. The plaintiff gets to claim the form of law he wants to prosecute under. And of course, I'm going to prosecute under common law. And of course, they're not going to accept that. But anyway, in a counterclaim, you know, the, your position is, is that they're going to have to pay you damages for unlawfully denying your right to liberty and for proceeding without having any jurisdiction over you, without proving their claim of having any jurisdiction, and violating all these other laws like, you know, corpus delecti, standing, real party of interest, all these other things. So that's the three forms. The first form is to deny them the access to you through saying that the pro service of process was defective, and that's what this show is about, showing you why you can get away without getting into service of process problems where they're going to say, well, we, do you acknowledge that uh, we sent you a letter on such and such a date? Um, yeah. Oh, so I guess you see then you're responsible. Because it's the word art that they use to trap you. And they'll, their trap will always take place with words. Okay, here we are in Black's Law 4th again, citizen. The term appears to have been used in the Roman government to designate a person who had the freedom of the city and the right to exercise all political and civil privileges of the, of it, the government. A member of a nation or body politic of the sovereign state or political society who owes allegiance. What's allegiance? I mean, what do you, what do you owe to anybody, right? You only owe something if you're contractually obligated or you're subject to their jurisdiction and a slave. American law. 
All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Okay, we know that's the 14th Amendment. The term may include or apply to an elector qualified to vote in an election. See, and that's how they tie you in. If you want to vote, then you are, co are contracting into being subject to all the laws that get voted for. I would think, you know, I mean, isn't that the agreement somewhat? Isn't that the agreement somewhat? Citizens, inhabitants, and residents often synonymous. So you're going to call yourself a resident, you're basically calling yourself a citizen. An inhabitant, citizen, they just took all the words that people would use at, that um, they would like to enforce their will on you with because anytime you say any of these things, they're saying their definition, the legal definition, not lawful definition or common use definition. Not the, not the word on the street definition. I mean, it's like if you went into the court with the bonics, are they going to recognize what you mean by that? You're going to make up your own words, then you get to run the show. Neither a corp corporation nor a partnership is a citizen of the United States entitled to immunity from service of summons by substituted service. Filipinos are not citizens of the United States. There you go. Citizen as including any individual owing allegiance to the United States. How do you like this one? But a state and the federal government each has citizens of its own. And the same person may be at the same time the citizen of the United States and a citizen of a state. The government of the United States can neither grant nor secure to its citizens rights or privileges which are not expressly or by implication placed under its jurisdiction. All that cannot be so granted or secured are left to the exclusive protection of the states. U.S. versus Crookshank. So there you go. You can claim to be a citizen of the state of California and not subject to the federal government. The federal government, the Constitution of the United States, can't be brought into a, into a state court and say, and you can't claim that you have constitutional rights. That was a dis, uh, decision in Barron. Now, if you're an Indian, the Indian nations are sovereign. That's why they can have gambling casinos on them, because the federal government can't tell them what to do, and the state government can't tell them what to do. And we all consider Native Americans as Indians, right? I mean, you see it in the news all the time. Now, why would the government want to call them Native Americans? Well, let's read what they consider the legal definition of Native, a natural-born subject or a citizen. So if you're going to call yourself a Native, then you're a subject. What's a subject? If you're a subject of the king, then, you're, then you have to do everything he tells you to. A citizen, a denizen by birth, one who owes his domicile or citizenship to the fact of his birth within the country referred to. So there they're saying, if you're going to claim that you're a native Californian, then you are claiming that you are a subject. See, they just take the words and co-opt them. And uh, they want you to start using the words that they give certain meanings to. So if you want to control the, the uh, discussion in a court or, or in any environment, you define your own terms. You just list out the terms you want to use, and you define them. And if they don't object to them, then those are the terms. And if they want to argue about what the terms mean, bring it. But at least if we agree on terms, then I know what, how to answer a question that you gave me, you know. Are you a resident? Well, I don't understand. Define the term resident. What are the duties and obligations of a resident? So I know that if I answer correctly, I know that I'm entering into an agreement where I'm going to accept the duties and obligations of that, of a, that entity. They won't want anything videotaped in the courtroom. They won't answer any of your paperwork. So you have to go in there and you have to do role play and know how to talk to the judge. But the first step is to put your ducks in a row by returning all of their little offers and do the um, denial of service of process. It's the appearance trap. Once you've appeared, then you're in for controversy in court. I would rather just avoid the whole issue. 
and avoiding service of process is the first step in avoiding the issue.